Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I am a pharmacist. That's, that's my primary training. Um, I graduated. Can everybody hear me okay? Closer? Okay. Um, I am a pharmacist. I'm, that's my primary training. That's where I kind of started out. Um, graduated in 2013 from, from Washington State. Um, I did a residency in, in Boise at St. Luke's uh, Hospital. Um, that was in primarily acute care and then when I finished that residency program I came back here to Cadillac. Um, I'm from Benton City originally so this was, this was home. I uh, came back here, I worked at the senior clinic as a, an ambulatory clinical pharmacist um, doing comprehensive medication management and review for patients there. Um, so the, the opioid topic really is pretty close to that and obviously the, the Healthy Ages group is a group that I've, I've spoken to a couple of times before. Um, more recently I've transitioned into a compliance role with Providence St. Joseph Health so I no longer see patients directly um, but I work in, in compliance specifically and a lot of that really ties into the regulations that we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, so that's kind of my, my overall background. I'm passionate about the opioid epidemic um, obviously because I worked with, with senior patients that uh, are, are very um, sensitive to these high-risk medications and opioids being a major player in that. Um, I've talked, uh, you know, I, I countless hours with senior patients about uh, the, the risks of opioids even before this epidemic um, started to really uh, be identified. So um, I've also had several close friends that have been affected um, by both prescription and, and some of the street drugs that, that ties into that. Um, and so I know, I know the pathway that that can, that can uh, transpire. And so I'm very uh, passionate about trying to help out uh, in any way that I can in, in talking to groups or individuals or uh, whatever it may be to help out. Um, and I think that this is a, a problem that all of us are affected by in one way or another, either personally as patients or um, very close encounters maybe as patients or at least our family members are probably experiencing some, some form of this. So. Also, I will tell you, I'm a little bit rusty today. So I'm, I just had a, a new son born about three weeks ago on uh, April 2nd. Um, I just came back this week. So if you, if you see me kind of pausing for a second or even glancing at my notes, I didn't memorize most of these statistics um, that I'll share with you early on in the presentation. That's what I'm probably glancing at. Um, but I will take questions at the end. I, I definitely know that there will be questions about some of these topics. So um, yeah, thank you. So I always start out with objectives. Really, the, the primary objectives here are to give you some background in terms of what the opioid epidemic is, um, what, what really inspired some of the actions that you're seeing the ramifications for today, um, what those regulations are that have caused some of these changes, um, and what the policies are that are affecting you probably as patients if you do receive any of these types of medications. Um, and, and hopefully with that you'll be able to understand some of the, the hiccups that you may start to see when you go to fill prescriptions for opioids or your family members are filling those prescriptions. Um, I also want to turn your attention real quick, I'm going to stick on that objective slide. Um, the handout today, there's some really good information on here, there's good statistics. Some of these statistics I'll cover in my presentation actually, some of them are maybe different than what's in the presentation. Um, not different in terms of what they represent, but maybe uh, I saw there was a statistic from Michigan uh, in here, for example, that, you know, obviously I don't cover that, um, but all still very applicable. Um, the other thing that I want to point out on there is there's a, a, a DEA National Take Back Day. These are events that happen um, once or twice a year, typically, uh, where the DEA actually really sponsors and, and endorses these take back programs where people can get rid of their unused and unwanted medications, including opioids, can, other controlled substances, and even legend drugs if, if they don't fall into those other categories. Um, the program is this Saturday, um, and I, I pulled up on my phone here uh, the locations that they're doing this at. You can take them to any police department in the Tri-Cities, Richland, Pasco, Kennewick. Uh, Pasco is actually sponsoring one at, at Walmart um, in Pasco. And then um, other outlying areas you can, you can find on the internet for these take back programs. Walla Walla is sponsoring one, um, Connell is sponsoring one, College Place. There's several, several police stations that are sponsoring these programs. You can find a full list if you don't live in the Tri-Cities area. You can go to uh, takebackday.dea.gov. You can punch in a zip code. It'll tell you where the closest programs are on Saturday. Um, in addition to that, you can typically take your controlled substances or any other unwanted medications 
um, to a police department for, for uh, destruction. There's also a registered take back uh, drop box at the Walgreens on Road 68 in Pasco. Um, that's a really convenient location. Some people don't like to go into a police station with their medications for whatever reason, so if you, if you prefer to be more discreet about that, um, the Road 68 Walgreens is a great location for that. Okay, so a couple of definitions here to start out. Um, I'm going to be talking and using some of these terms. I want to make sure you guys understand what those terms are. Uh, an opiate is a, a terminology that we use primarily when we're talking about natural opioids or semi-synthetic opioids. Those are ones that are closer to sort of the parent <coughs> compound that we discovered these drugs based on. Um, and so typically those are things that are more closely related to opium, which is the, the uh, actual plant that we, we derived uh, these, these products from originally. Opioid is a little bit more of a, a larger terminology that includes both those natural and semi-synthetic opiates, but also includes the fully synthetic opioids such as fentanyl. And then morphine is a really important drug to be familiar with when we talk about opioids. Morphine is one of the older uh, medicinally used products on the market still, and it's still sort of the reference standard that we compare other opioids to in terms of potency. So you'll hear me use the term MME in this presentation. MME refers to milligrams morphine equivalent or morphine milligrams equivalent. Um, what that means is how many milligrams of morphine um, the reference drug would, would, would equate to. So if we're talking about fentanyl, for example, it might say um, 100 milligram morphine equivalents, and that's, that's what it's referring to. This is a much longer definition, opioid use disorder. Um, I'm not going to read all the way through this, but you'll hear me talk about this. Um, basically, this is sort of a pattern um, that includes uh, at least two of, of characteristics, including um, taking more than you want, being unable to stay away from the drugs, or not taking them as prescribed, um, experiencing withdrawal if you don't take them uh, as prescribed, um, or maybe some tolerance, or, or various different components of that. But in general, this opioid use disorder uh, is sort of a, 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 a step towards sort of this addiction and, and potential for overdose. Okay, so as we all know, opioids commonly are used uh, as, as analgesic medications, meaning they treat pain. Um, that's their primary purpose. They can be used, depending on the opioid that you're talking about, they might be used for mild to moderate pain, moderate to severe pain, or severe pain. Um, there are different strengths of opioids depending on how severe your pain is. Um, we can also use higher doses of, of some of the less potent ones to achieve uh, pain control at a higher level. These uh, opioids can also be used, although a little bit less commonly, for cough suppression. Um, and then they obviously can be used to help treat addiction, um, such as you've, you've all heard of methadone clinics. There's other uh, products out there now called Suboxone or Subutex or these kinds of things that are used a little bit more frequently in the addiction world. Um, and then these opioids are also commonly used for anesthesia purposes. When we talk about opioids, these are the drugs typically we're referring to. Um, you're probably familiar with some of the more common ones. So you've got on the left hand side here, um, your natural opioids, which is morphine, codeine. Those are probably the most commonly ones that we refer to. We've got semi-synthetic opioids, hydrocodone, oxycodone are probably the more common ones that you've heard of. We've also got the synthetic opioids, which are primarily fentanyl, methadone. Tramadol kind of sort of fits here. It's not a true opioid, um, but it targets uh, the same receptors, and so it's often thrown into the, the same uh, considerations in terms of risks. So as far as how opioids work to treat pain, um, the, the primary mechanism for how these opioids work is they, they typically work on three different receptors in the body, um, mu, delta, and kappa receptors. Um, those receptors, um, depending on which receptor you're talking about, have different downstream effects. The primary one for pain control purposes that we're talking about is the mu opioid receptor. The mu opioid receptor works here, uh, typically in the, in, the spine, um, in the spinal cord, so that when you receive a pain, painful stimuli that is basically blunted, 
and we slow down the transmission of that painful stimuli to the brain so that you don't sense the pain as much. Um, the secondary pathways, they actually work by getting into the brain um, and working in a downstream way um, on the modulation pathway. Uh, what this basically does is, is uh, we've all kind of experienced this where you, let's say you hit your finger with a hammer or something like that. You get that very sharp pain initially, and then over time that pain sort of subsides, right? And that's what we call pain modulation. Your brain just needs to know that there was pain. It doesn't need to continue to get that signal. And so your brain, once it receives that signal, starts saying, hey, cut it out. I don't need to know more about this. You've already told me. Um, and that modulation pathway is the second thing that, that opioids tend to, to work in, in down, or sorry, up regulating. So they help modulate that pain to a higher extent. The um, risks of opioid therapy are numerous. Um, I'll talk in a second about the side effects, but here specifically I'm talking about sort of the, the more um, troublesome risks, I guess you would say. Um, I put this picture here. Um, one, of the, one of the quotes that you'll hear referenced when we talk about the opioid epidemic is that there's no free lunch in nature. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of uh, Dr. Drew. Um, he obviously is an addiction medicine specialist, and uh, that's, a, that's a quote that I've heard him say a lot of times when he's talking to addicts and that sort of thing. What that means is, you know, no free lunch in nature. That quote actually goes back to, um, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred years ago probably. One of the ways uh, uh, barkeepers would entice people to come into their taverns and such was by offering free meals to people that are there drinking. Um, so that was kind of the free lunch, right? You got a free lunch if you went into these these bars, and typically those were salty, salty foods. People wanted to drink more. They stayed longer, drank more and more. Um, so it was a good way to, to make some money. Um, what, what Dr. Drew says is there's no free lunch in nature, meaning that, you know, yeah, you might get rewarded by having less pain with these opioids, but there are going to be downstream consequences of that drug therapy. And that's true of not just opioids. That's true of really any medical intervention, right? There's always side effects. That's why we um, that's why we always have those side effect statements with medications. That's why you typically have some sort of a consent to a procedure if you're having a surgery or something like that. There's always possibilities that something would go other than how you would idealize or, or, or for the negative. So some of those potential risks, opioid use disorder, physical dependence, falls and accidents, increased sensitivity to pain, and overdose. Um, those risks are increased if you're pregnant, if you have a history of uh, substance abuse, if you're uh, over the age of 65, um, if you have certain mental health conditions, or if you're on uh, combination medications that interact with the opioid therapy. I want to go back and touch on increased sensitivity to pain. This is probably an entire separate lecture, um, but there is a, an entire uh, uh, body of work that's being done around the concern that opioids might actually worsen your pain. Um, and, and that is typically referred to as opioid-induced hyperalgesia, meaning opioids causing you more pain. Um, and that is a, a real concern. The, there's a couple of theories about how that happens. Um, one thing that opioids are known to do is they uh, upregulate certain receptors that uh, transduce pain, and they cause your body to respond to uh, lesser stimuli. So things that normally shouldn't be painful now become painful to you. The other thing that happens, opioids are endogenous, meaning our body has its own opioids as well. When you're on high doses and chronically taking opioids, one of the quickest things that happens is tolerance. Your body becomes tolerant to opioids, and the endogenous opioids that are supposed to help you cope with the daily pains of life are not able to produce the response that they would like to produce. So now you've got two different things sort of working against you. And you find that in most chronic opioid patients, I've talked to a lot of them, they don't typically tell me that their pain is controlled or that their pain is even uh, commonly is, is, is probably not less than a three. Most of them still report to me moderate to severe pain, even though they're taking quite a bit of uh, morphine equivalents uh, in terms of their pain medications. So that's a real problem and, and certainly something to read about if you're interested. Um, like I said, that's not a topic for today, but it's something I wanted to highlight for you. Um, the other side effects of opioids, again, very numerous. Um, tolerance is something that we just talked about. Uh, physical dependence, 
Um, dependence is different than addiction. Physical dependence means if I miss a dose, I feel like I'm getting a withdrawal, or I miss a couple of doses, or particularly a couple of days. That's, you know, the, the signs of, of withdrawing. You might be sweating, you might be irritable, anxious, those kinds of things. That's a sign of dependence. Addiction is an entirely different part of the brain, um, and you can, be t you can have uh, some form of dependence, or quite a bit of dependence, uh, without having addiction. It, it's a different, different uh, pathway entirely. One way that I've heard an addict explain it is, you know, dependence feels like um, I need to get that drug back in my system um, because it's making me sick not to have it. Um, addiction typically means I'll do anything to get that drug back in my system. And, and that, that, if you think about it that way, I think that's a good way to, to, to reference it. The more obvious side effects, constipation, um, drowsiness, dizziness, um, itching, sweating, depression, confusion, all those things. If you've ever taken an opioid, um, I have for surgeries and such, you'll get, you'll get those things almost guaranteed, particularly the constipation for most people. One of the big ones, and the reason we're probably here today, is the respiratory depression. Um, that is a major side effect of opioid therapy, um, perhaps one of the more concerning side effects of opioid therapy. When we talk about overdose, really what we're talking about is this, this piece of this here. Um, respiratory depression basically means um, your respiratory rate goes down, the lung capacity uh, diminishes, you're not, your lungs aren't expanding as much as they would like to, and as such you're not ventilating as well or as much every, every minute. Um, and, and that means your oxygen levels in your blood are going to go down. The other scary part of opioids is they decrease your body's ability to sense that oxygen level. So as those oxygen levels go down, your body's normal response would be to breathe uh, more frequently or, or those lungs would expand more, your body's not sensing that anymore. It's also not sensing the fact that your carbon dioxide level is going up. And that's what typically leads to opioid overdose. So opioid overdose, these are some signs and symptoms. Um, small constricted pupils, uh, falling asleep when you don't intend to fall asleep, dozing off, shallow breathing, choking sounds, your body goes limp, and in particular if you see somebody that's having an overdose, they're going to be pale, they're going to be blue, they're not going to look very well. Okay, so now we're moving into some statistics. So I've got a few maps here, I've got a few numbers I'm going to share with you. These are really important, I think, because they really highlight how big of a problem the opioid epidemic is, particularly in America. Um, a key takeaway from this picture, so this is a map uh, of the world, obviously. Red is not good. Um, so United States are red, um, Canada's red, um, and you see a couple other uh, European, I'm not real good with geography, that was my worst subject in school. Um, one of the only ones I wasn't good at actually. And then you got Australia down here. So what those numbers mean is uh, consumption of opioids, and, and basically this is a way to quantify how many opioids are consumed per capita, uh, per person in that area. Red is not a number to shoot for. Um, but what this graph actually represents, I looked up this article to figure out what they were talking about. 92% of the world's morphine is consumed by 17% of the world's population. So, um, well, I, I looked at that number at first and I was kind of blown away, right? 92% of the morphine in the world consumed by 17% of the population. Part of that's because, you know, that 17% of the population represents probably a more industrialized part of the world a part of the world where we're doing more procedures that require opiates for one thing, um, but there's definitely some factor there that, you know, there's, a, there's not a good distribution there. We don't want to be part of that, that uh, 17 percent, um, but we are. The United States accounts for 5.1 percent of the world's population. Um, anyone want to guess how much of the world's morphine we consume? So we're 5 percent of the world's population. You think it's over 50? Yeah. 50 56 percent of the world's morphine um, is consumed by Americans. Um, so, and we're just 5 percent of the world's population. So, that's a, that's a pretty staggering number. So, if that's not enough, um, this graph uh, is taken from a different source. Um, this kind of uh, exemplifies that a little bit better. So, you've got the United States. We are 5.1 percent. 56% um, of the world's morphine uh, consumption. Um, I don't know, Canada maybe is a good, a good country to compare us to, although we're quite a bit bigger than Canada. 
um, obviously. Canada represents something like 0.6%, less than 1% of the world's population, um, and they're consuming um, right in line with that. They're, they're really not con out consuming themselves a whole lot. They're at 6%. So, um, you know, that, that's uh, a pretty big difference there, I would say. They kind of lump some uh, nations together for some of these. Australia and New Zealand, 0.4%, um, they consume 3%. Um, and again, they were red on that previous graph, so they were bad. Uh, if you want to call them good or bad, they were they were in the bad category. We're even worse than that. So um, I think that's that's pretty alarming. Some more maps and, and uh, graphics here for you. Um, this on the left hand side, obviously, um, the Washington State is kind of what I'm looking at here. So as far as opioid pain relievers, we do pretty well overall. We're we're one of the lighter colored blues on here. Um, for benzodiazepines, which we'll talk about in a second, we're, we're doing pretty well. We're uh, in the white. Where we have a bigger problem is typically with the long-acting or extended-release opioid pain relievers. Um, and then again, we do fairly well with the high dose. Now part of that is you start reading this literature and you'll actually see uh, the state of Washington is referenced pretty frequently as being in sort of exemplary state in terms of our regulations. Um, the state of Washington is sort of ahead of the times typically uh, in a lot of ways in the medical community, and this, this isn't an exception. We, we do pretty well in terms of trying to get ahead of these problems, and I think that's, that's what we're seeing here on the graph is, is Washington's not bad. Typically referenced as the worst state um, is, is Alabama, or at least somewhere in the south. Um, I've heard Alabama, Mississippi in, in different reports, but they typically get reported as being among the poorest performers in, in this type of uh, study. In the state of Washington, in 2017, we had 739 deaths that were related to opioid overdose. We had 1,600 hospitalizations. In 2015, there was 14,000 opioid uh, use disorder admissions to the hospital and 324,000 individuals 12 years of age and older who misused opioids in the previous year in 2016. So this is a very big problem for sure. Um, this is a a depiction of counties that are performing um, worse than one prescription for opioids per person. So per 100 people, one per person would be 100 prescriptions. Um, Benton County was um, down here at the bottom. It's like 100 and, uh, you can't see it here, but I think it was 111 or something like that uh, prescriptions per person in Benton County. Are we red or white? Benton, Benton County was red. Franklin County was white, and the, the data wasn't reported for Franklin County on this, on this graphic, but um, Benton County was in the red. So We have improved in Benton County, though. The, the, the number that got us into the red, the 111, was in it was about five or six years ago, if I remember the data correctly. The more recent report, we were just under one prescription per person. Okay, so this is a... Good information. So this gets a little bit into the data here. Um, I'm, I'm going to be reading these slides again. So 191 million opioid prescriptions were dispensed to American patients in 2017. Um, there's a wide variation amongst states. Um, like I said, Alabama typically the por poorest performer. The best performing state has been reported as Hawaii. Um, studies suggest that regional variation in the use of prescription opioids cannot be explained by the health status of the population. So what that means is this isn't necessarily because people in Alabama are sicker. This means that something else is going on in terms of how opioids are prescribed or the practical side of things. It's not necessarily that they're doing more surgeries or having more chronic pain. Um, and so that sort of speaks to the reasoning behind some of these regulations that are coming out. The next picture is probably my favorite. So this really shows what inspired the action that we're seeing today. So in 1999 is where this graph starts, 2017 is where it ends. There are three different waves that are identified. The first wave that you see is the rise in prescription opioid overdose deaths. Now you trace this back a little bit farther and what you'll hear physicians that have been practicing medicine for 20 or 30 years pain became sort of a vital sign in the uh, you know, late 80s, early 90s, somewhere in there. And we started being graded a little bit more for how we treated pain. And so they started prescribing more opioids to treat pain, um, which is the obvious response. Uh, 
And so then around 1999, you start to see the prescription opioid deaths start to go up. Um, somewhere in the 2000s, um, particularly around 2010 is when people started talking about, hey, we're, we're over-prescribing these opioids. We need to cut back a little bit. What did I tell you about addiction earlier as far as how you can separate that from dependence? If you're addicted to opioids, you'll do almost anything to get opioids, right? So if someone says you can't have your prescription opioids anymore, what are you going to do? You're going to find some more, and you can't find more. It's hard to find prescription opioids on the street. Typically, where people are going to turn is to morphine, uh, or sorry, heroin. And so we saw around 2010, heroin deaths started to increase and go upwards. Um, and, and that continues to be the trend today. It started to flatten out a little bit. One thing that's really scary right now is we're starting to see these synthetic opioids on the street uh, at a much higher rate, and it's especially fentanyl is what we're seeing a lot of on the street. Um, and, and we're starting to see the deaths from tramadol and fentanyl start to go up pretty significantly because fentanyl's almost come, become cheaper than heroin in a lot of ways because it's synthetic and um, they're importing it from other countries and so forth to, to get it to these markets. Um, I have another graph that's very similar to that one. This one is specifically in Washington. Um, and the only reason I threw this on here was because it is very much the same graph. So um, I just want to show you that this problem that we're seeing across the nation is also a problem here in Washington. So prescription opioids, again, going back to about 2000, we saw the uptick in prescription opioid deaths. And around 2010, we saw that start to level out and maybe even come down a little bit. We saw heroin start to pick up in 2010, and we're starting to see it tail off a little bit. One other thing you'll notice here um, is, is that these two data lines are very similar to what's going on in this picture. So I, I just want you to be clear that this is a problem, like Corey said, in, in, in the Tri-Cities and Washington as well as uh, the rest of the country. Not going to go into these. These are much the same statistics that are on the handout that you guys got today. Um, I think most importantly is that 36% of all opioid overdose deaths involve a prescription opioid. So a lot of people, from what I've heard, my wife's a retail pharmacist, and I know a lot of retail pharmacists, obviously. Um, we've, we've really been pushing a rescue drug called naloxone much more recently. Um, a lot of patients will say, well, I don't need naloxone, I'm not an addict, or I don't need naloxone because I'm not going to overdose, I take my medications how they're prescribed. The truth is, I mean, the, the drugs that are killing people aren't just heroin and, and people that are addicted. There's an awful lot of people that die from or at least overdose from opioids, even if they're taking them as directed by their physician. That, that happens pretty frequently. Okay, so that was the statistics part. That's, that's all the background I wanted to give you. Did that seem to kind of create the case that there is a real problem going on? Now, you know, something that we probably need to do something about. Um, I think what we do is, is probably still a point of contention, but um, I think it's pretty obvious that there's a significant issue going on, both in, in Washington and across the country. What I want to talk about specifically, so when, when this became, when this was brought forward as a, as a real problem in an epidemic, we started seeing some guidelines come out, which I'm going to talk about real uh, briefly. Then we saw some regulations come out, which are actually laws around this sort of stuff. And then now we're seeing some actual policies by payers. So Medicare, et cetera, uh, is formulating policies around this sort of thing. So in 2016, the CDC came out uh, in response to a publication that was in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report that's published by the CDC. Um, that report uh, in the MMWR was what really highlighted how big of an issue this was uh, in the United States. They responded with developing a guideline. Now, specifically, the guideline was for chronic pain, but it really talked about, um, you know, how we, how we keep patients from developing these uh, opioid use disorders, how we keep patients safe, prevent opioid overdoses, et cetera. Uh, I'm not going to dive into these two uh, in depth. Um, this is just kind of an overview of, of what the recommendations are. There are 12 different recommendations, and they'll be on the next slide here in, in just a minute. Um, 
some of the big ones I want to talk about. So I'll, I'll tell you what the 12 are first of all, and then I'll kind of I'll kind of walk you through some of the important ones. So number one was that opioids are not first line therapy. Number two is that we want to establish goals for pain and function. Number three, discuss risks and benefits with patients. Number four, use immediate acting opioids rather than long acting. Uh, number five was to use the lowest effective doses. Uh, six, prescribe short acting uh, opiates for acute pain. Seven was to evaluate the benefits and harms frequently. Eight was to use strategies to mitigate risk. Nine was to review the prescription uh, drug monitoring program data. Ten was to use urine drug screening. Eleven was to avoid concomitant opioid prescribing with benzodiazepines. And number twelve was to offer treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, those, uh, th this was written in 2016. I remember reading this the day it was published and thinking, man, you know, this is, this is kind of a big step forward from what we're currently doing. Now I go back and look at that and I think, well, duh, why weren't we doing this all along? I mean, a lot of these things are, are really common sense to me at this point. But three years ago when this was published, it was, it was sort of new, new stuff that a lot of people weren't necessarily thinking about. So opioids are not first-line therapy. There's lots of examples of how you could avoid opioids as first-line therapy. Um, physical therapy, um, weight loss, non-opioid pharmacologic agents. Um, interventional procedures is a big one, especially for certain types of pain. Specifically for non-opioid, I've, I've put this in here um, as a reference. This is taken out of Washington's agency medical director's guidelines. Um, lots of different options for pain. Again, not going into these in depth, but you can see for various different types of pain, there are lots of non-opioid options. Typically what these revolve around is um, for inflammatory pain, we're talking about uh, potentially steroid injections or anti-inflammatory medications or even just Tylenol. Um, for uh, fibromyalgia, which is a pretty common uh, pain syndrome, um, typically, we're talking about antidepressants or uh, possibly anticonvulsant medications. Uh, but the point here is that there are other modalities that are, actually have better evidence and are much safer for patients for most types of chronic pain. Um, one thing that's really important to highlight, I think, is that opioids, in terms of safety and efficacy, have never really been well studied or evaluated for chronic treatment of pain. There's not a lot of good evidence that they work long term. Um, and these other treatment options may work better and be much safer for those patients. Discuss risks and benefits. Um, you know, we want to talk about exactly what the benefits are of opioid therapy. It can be great medicine, particularly early on for acute pain. Typically, we want to cap that at, you know, 7 to 14 days. In most cases, most types of pain, particularly surgical pain, should be resolved within 7 to 14 days, and if that's not resolving, then you may have something else going on that needs to be addressed. Um, and so that's, that's really where opioids should primarily be used. There are cases where they need to be used long term or maybe even for the rest of your life, but those cases are much less common than maybe we're currently prescribing for. Obviously the risks are all those things that we've talked about early on, all those risks of dependence, overdose, you know, addiction, all these things that we've already talked about, um, those should be clearly discussed with the provider before we're starting down this pathway. We want to use the lowest effective doses, and I think that this is really important as well. Um, so here you see the MME per day, and again, that stands for morphine milligram equivalents. So this is how many <coughs> milligrams of morphine per day. So we want to be this is sort of an ideal range, 1 to 20 morphine equivalents per day. So compared to 1 to 20, if we bump that up to 50 to 100, that increases the risk of overdose by five times. Now, if we go beyond 100, you're looking at nine times the risk of overdose. So your, your risk starts going up and up and up. Now, I've seen a, a fair number of patients that are taking over 500 morphine equivalents per day. Um, that's a lot, a, a staggering amount, you know, enough that if I took that, I, I wouldn't be here talking to you anymore, okay? So their tolerance has built up to allow for them to take that amount, but that doesn't make it a safe amount. That's a really dangerous amount of opioids. Among patients prescribed chronic opioid therapy, 91 days or more, uh, the risk of opioid use disorder increases with the dose. So if you take 1 to 36 morphine equivalents per day, that's 15 times the risk. 
medium, this is compared to no opioid therapy, medium dose 29 times, high dose 122 times the risk of developing opioid use disorder. So the more you take, the more likely you're going to either overdose or end up, end up with an opioid use disorder, which is a, a psychological uh, uh, criteria for that. Duration. So we said dose, higher dose, more problematic. You can probably guess the same thing for duration. The longer you're on opioids, the, long, the harder it's going to be to get off of those opioids. So this graph is showing the probability uh, at one year or three years that you're going to still be on an opioid based on the initial day's supply. So if I, not I gave you, but if your doctor gave you five days supply of an opioid, your risk of being on that in a year is, we'll say it's about, you know, 7%. Your risk of being on it in three years is about 5%. That's already a pretty high risk for me. I mean, that, that sounds like a lot. But you look at out here, if you end up with 30 days, which that, that kind of used to be the thing. I remember when that, that was the thing. You'd get a 30-day supply of hydrocodone, maybe even for just a dental procedure or something like that, right? So you look at the risk there. So at 30, if you get a 30-day supply, in one year there's a 35 or 40 percent risk that you'll still be on that, and in three years there's about a 20 percent risk. So very, very high risk depending on how many days you're initially prescribed. Washington AMDG guidelines. So this stands for Washington's Agency of Medical Directors Group. So there's an agency that, that meets and talks about these sorts of risk-based uh, concerns. Opioids isn't the only thing they tackle. It's one good example, though. They made the statement in their guideline. Now, their guideline is, is really, really good. And, and um, I know we don't have practicing physicians in the room, probably. Maybe we do. Um, this guideline is excellent, better than the CDC's guidelines because it's not specifically talking about chronic opioid uh, use. It's, it's talking more globally about opioid prescribing in general. Uh, it actually breaks that down into acute, subacute, and chronic. Um, but they have a very thorough algorithm for how we should be using opioids in our practices. Um, and this, to me, is a more important guideline for the day-to-day -day opioid prescribing that we typically see. But they said there is little evidence to support long-term efficacy of COAT, which stands for uh, Chronic Opioid Analgesic Therapy, in improving function and pain, and there is ample evidence of its risks for harm. Prescribers should proceed with caution when considering whether to initiate opioids or transition to chronic therapy. So um, this is a pretty good statement, just you know, one sentence out of, uh, I don't know how many pages, 40-page guideline, but I think this is a really important one. Like I said, they break it up into three stages, acute, which is zero to six weeks, subacute, which is six to 12 weeks, and then chronic, which is greater than 12 weeks. Uh, for acute pain, this is what I was talking about, where initially someone comes in and they've got, uh, you know, whatever type of pain, I don't have a good example because I, I don't know that there's a really good example for opioids for acute pain. Um, I'm probably in the far off, you know, opinions of that, but um, I'll give you some background. So my, my first son was born uh, in 2016. Ten days after he was born, uh, I ran my hand through a table saw. Uh, my, my grandpa was a, you know, lifetime woodworker and, and uh, carpenter, and he would have said, well, you dummy, you got to keep your hand out of the saw, right? Um, so I, I did that, right? Went to the hospital, had surgery. You can see I've still got my whole hand, so I'm thankful for that. It doesn't work quite like it used to, but I've got my whole hand. Um, I did take opioids while I was in the hospital. The pain was excruciating. I mean, the, the most pain I've ever felt, and I have a very high pain tolerance. But before I went home, I said, I'm not, I'm not going home on opioids. And so about a day before I left, actually it was almost exactly 24 hours, I said, no more. I don't want any more, any more pain medications besides Tylenol, ibuprofen. And I asked the doctor for gabapentin. Um, he said he hadn't really used gabapentin before because it's more commonly used for chronic pain. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I think it's worth a shot because I don't want to be taking opioids when I leave the hospital. Uh, long story short is I, I didn't take any opioids after I went home. Um, and so, you know, that's a pretty significant injury. I cut um, one of my fingers basically completely was not attached anymore. It was still attached, but there wasn't much holding it there. Um, the other three fingers were pretty significantly injured. And, um, you know, there, there was pain, and it still hurts from time to time if it gets cold or so forth. But the point is, you know, you can get through some of these things. I think pain's a good signal. Um, I, I think there's some, some positives to be garnered from that. Um, I'll also tell you my wife's had two C-sections, um, both with our first boy and then with our second boy. 
um, and she took no opioids for either of those, either in the hospital or out of the hospital. And that's a pretty major procedure, right? Um, so I think that's important. But at any rate, if you need to take opioids, I'm not telling you don't take them. If you've got pain, we don't want you suffering necessarily. Um, but 7 to 14 days, that should really be the limit. And typically for acute non-surgical pain, we're talking about 7 days. That should be reevaluated. Now, if you've still got pain in 7 days, you may require another 7 days. But we don't just give you the full you know, 14 or 30 days up front because we don't want you developing that uh, opioid use disorder. We don't want you developing those downstream consequences. For subacute pain, um, again, we, st we might stretch this out a little bit more. You may get, um, you know, 7 to 14 days when you're in the subacute phase, and that goes all the way through that first 12 weeks after whatever injury or, or mechanism of, of pain there is. <laughs> Typically, when you've got an acute injury and you move into the subacute phase, one of the things you want to start thinking about, if you're still having pain after six weeks, we should be looking maybe at some other potential uh, causes of pain maybe, I, I guess I wouldn't say causes of pain, but other things that are, that are influencing your pain, such as do you have clinical depression? Are you suffering from insomnia? Do you have um, fibromyalgia that um, you know, is potentially worsening also in, in, in combination with this acute pain event? We need to figure out what those other causes are and really dive, dive down deep and figure out what's, what's, what else is going on that's causing your pain to last longer than it should. And then finally, for chronic, if you do transition into that phase, one in five patients roughly are probably going to end up in the chronic pain scenario where they may be on opioids long term. Um, and, and with that, we really need to start considering, you know, which opioids we use, how we go about that, you know, how, how consistent you are in, in, in following the directions of the prescriber and so forth. But um, really the goal is to keep you out of that chronic pain or chronic opioid therapy phase. When to reduce or taper, I think this is a good just overall thought to have in your mind. I mean, we should always be thinking about reducing or, ta or tapering opioids, in my opinion, for just about anybody that's on them. Um, but in, in specific, if people are telling you, hey, I want to get off opioids, I mean, that's when you really need to jump in. If you go to your physician and say, hey, I, I'd like to get off this OxyContin. I don't want to take it forever. That should be taken very seriously. If someone's telling you that, that means there's there's you know, maybe something else going on, but at least that patient's motivated. And it takes a lot of motivation sometimes to get off these opioids. Um, other key factors that they talk about, um, patients been on opioids for at least three months and they're, they're not improving. So you should be seeing marked improvement in, in either or both pain and functioning. Um, and so if you're not seeing improvement, why continue to take the opioids? Um, I've asked a lot of patients that question, you know, if, if you're still having the same amount of pain as you've always had, what, what's the point in these opioids? What are they really doing for you, um, even if you're not addicted or, or maybe even not dependent on them? Um, patients experience a severe adverse outcome or they've had an overdose, they've got substance abuse uh, or substance use disorder. Um, patients are not in compliance or they're exhibiting signs of aberrant behaviors. Um, you know, they're sharing their pills or they're um, stockpiling them or whatever they might be doing. Okay, so that's kind of a couple of the main guidelines. There's other guidelines out there, but what I really want to talk about is, you know, so what's, what's next? Um, this is regulatory compliance. It's kind of what I do. Get a whole bunch of questions in. It takes forever to answer them. I feel like this all the time. Um, but one of the big regulations that hit Washington in 2017 was uh, uh, this uh, engrossed substitute house bill 1427. These rules were staggered into effect depending on the commissions that they're affecting. So um, for nurse practitioners, DOs, osteopathic PAs, and um, uh, this is podiatrists, November 1st, 2018. And then in 2019, January is when it hit the other professions. Excluded from these rules are cancer-related pain, um, sort of end-of-life care, inpatient treatment, and procedural medications. But specifically, these are starting to put guardrails, and these are actual regulations that you know, could put a physician's license in jeopardy, for example, if they don't follow these regulations. Um, in general, what these regulations require, and I know this is tiny, you guys can't read this, um, but for acute pain, it puts basically globally, so these are the different, these are the requirements on the left, these are the boards on the top. So, for a DO, a dentist, a physician, a nurse practitioner, and then for a podiatrist. 
Now, most of these are the same across the board, but this is the way they presented it um, to these different boards. So for acute pain, so that zero to six weeks, what they're saying is uh, you should only be prescribing a seven day limit unless you've got it documented in the chart somewhere that there's a need for more than seven days. For subacute pain, it puts a 14 day limit unless it's clinically documented that you need more than 14 days. For chronic pain, um, you have to consult with a pain consult or pain specialist at 120 morphine equivalents. There has to be a written agreement for treatment. You have to provide uh, or rec you have to offer to provide naloxone to those patients. Um, there has to be a periodic review of the treatment plan and the prescription monitoring program, which is an online database that tells us what opioids a patient's getting. And then there's a mandatory co-prescribing uh, requirement that the uh, uh, provider review benzodiazepines, sedatives, other things that could be high risk in combination with opioids. <laughs> Um, PMP requirements, so we're checking the PMP, which is that online database, at regular intervals. And then you actually have to put, for some licenses, you have to put a diagnosis or an ICD code on the prescription for an opioid. So if you're a dentist or you're a nurse practitioner, basically, you have to be putting those diagnoses on the prescription itself. So that was a big regulation. So you can put all the regulations in place you want, right? So you can make laws. There's not really someone necessarily enforcing those unless, unless a patient actually reported their provider um, as being outside of the regulation. No one would probably catch up with them, honestly. What's happening now, though, is that insurance payers are starting to recognize that, number one, there's these guidelines in place that the CDC put out. Um, number two, there's state regulations in virtually every state. Some states are more lax and other states are a little more restrictive. Um, but at any rate, they have the insurers or the payers now have very good uh, footing to help establish their clinical guidelines in terms of what they'll pay for for these medications at the pharmacy. Um, and so what we're seeing is more policies being created around the people that are actually paying for prescriptions, typically Medicare for most prescriptions in the United States. Um, they're putting in these policies that say, hey, we're, we're going to do the same sort of thing where we're looking out for the safety of our patients um, and we're going to start you know, requiring certain elements to be met. So the CMS policy, this went into effect January 2019, and if you've gotten a new opioid prescription since that date, you may have noticed some impact here. If you were already on opioids and, and maybe you were on chronic therapy before that date, this probably didn't affect you because um, Patients can be grandfathered in. If, if you were already on that chronic therapy, uh, it shouldn't have affected you. Also excluded are cancer-related pain, again, into life care and long-term care patients. What this basically boils down to is two different pieces. There are safety alerts, which are alerts that flag at the pharmacy when you fill the prescription. Some of them are what we call hard edits, meaning the pharmacist has to document that they've done something about that alert. Other ones are soft edits, meaning they can kind of bypass them, but they might have to communicate with you about something. Uh, and then there's also these drug management programs. If you're on particularly high-risk medications and so forth, you may actually end up in a drug management program, and they may start saying uh, certain things that you have to do as a patient to continue to get those medications. The safety alerts are a seven-day supply limit for opioid-naive patients. That means you've never taken an opioid uh, before or you at least haven't taken an opioid in the preceding um, 60 days. Um, and so if that's the case and you get an opioid prescription, Medicare will, will only allow a seven-day supply. Uh, if you exceed 90 morphine equivalents, the pharmacist has to reach out to your physician and communicate with them that, hey, did you know that this patient's getting um, you know, a prescription from, from Dr. Brown and Dr. Smith and you know some other physician down the street and they're currently getting over 90 morphine equivalents. Um, basically the physician has to attest to that and once that happens then they can go ahead and dispense that. Uh, concurrent benzodiazepines, so again benzodiazepines are sedative medications like lorazepam, oxazepam, temazepam, um, those types of medications. Typically they end in azepam. Alprazolam is another one. Um, that's a soft edit, so the pharmacist will probably just have to talk to you if that's the case. Uh, 
If they're on more than one long-acting opioid, they may get flagged and have some issues there. And then there's a, an optional hard edit if a patient hits 200 morphine equivalents, which basically has the same requirements as this 90 uh, morphine equivalents. The pharmacist has to talk to your physician. Drug management programs are really interesting. Um, basically, what these boil down to, uh, I think I've got it on the next slide. We're getting close to the end, I promise. I know I'm pushing up against the, the edge here. So coverage limitation tools for these um, drug management programs. There are patient-specific point-of-sale claim edits, pharmacy limitations, and prescriber limitations. Let's talk about pharmacy and prescriber limitations first because those are easier to explain. Basically, the, the plan will say, hey, you're on a whole bunch of opioids. We want to make sure you're safe, so we want to make sure you're using one provider and one pharmacy for your opioids. And they might also lump in your benzodiazepines as well. Um, they can't tell you which one to use. You, you still get to pick your provider. You get to pick your pharmacy. Nothing can, that's a right. They can't take that away from you. Um, but you have to designate who that provider is and who that pharmacy is. And they will only fill those prescriptions if you're using those two elements. Does that make sense? A patient-specific point-of-sale claim edit. Um, I wrote this one down because I didn't fully understand. So basically what they're doing is they're saying they're going to limit all opioids and benzodiazepines or limit specific drugs or a specific amount for one patient. So, um, you know, Jane Doe uh, has had an awful lot of benzodiazepines in the past. We're only going to let her have alprazolam one milligram three times a day, and that's it. She can't have alprazolam and temazepam and, you know, the other two benzos that she's taking. She has to just do that one and that specific dose. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm not going to go into this other stuff, but know that you have rights. For all this stuff, you have rights to appeal. Um, typically, that requires a provider to sign off on, but typically for all these types of things, you have the right to appeal uh, any type of decision, particularly under a drug management plan. This one I'm not going to go into unless there are questions on this being sensitive to time. This is the Washington Healthcare Authority policy. Um, this would only impact patients that have a Medicaid uh, plan alongside their Medicare plan. Um, typically what this refers to uh, in general is that there's limits, there's prescribing limits for acute short-acting opioids. So if you've got acute pain, they'll only pay for a certain quantity of those drugs the first time around. If you end up needing more, that's fine, but the first fill they'll only do uh, these 18 doses for, for young patients and 42 doses for patients over 20. That's most of what I have. I do have bonus slides um, on a couple of topics here. Um, expectations of providers on opioid therapy and then the opioid reversal agent. Um, I put those on there just in case I had questions. I'm going to leave this slide up for you guys to read. These are things that you should think about if you get an opioid from your provider, uh, from your physician or your nurse practitioner. Um, these are good standards of care um, that, that hopefully they're following. Um, and, and I would recommend if they're not to call them out on it. You know, ask them, hey, um, I noticed you're not doing um, a urine drug test on me. Is there a reason why? Um, urine drug tests, you know, maybe not necessary for every single patient, uh, probably not necessary for every single patient. Um, but when you suspect that maybe a patient's not taking the opioids the way you prescribe them or they're taking other drugs that you don't know about, that would be the primary reasons to do those. So if they feel like you're a very compliant patient that you've known for 30 or 40 years, they might be not be doing those all the time. So 